Lemon of AARP Texas. As a sponsor, we hope that you are gaining new insights into family caregiving and that you have the opportunity to connect with other caregivers and experts on aging. Family caregiving is a priority for AARP. It is essential to our work today, but that's not all. AARP is doing amazing things to make life better for the age 50 plus populations and the generations to follow. We help improve their financial well being and their health. We want people to contribute to society and local communities and to fully enjoy life. Some of you may already know that AARP has a strong presence throughout Texas in many communities in this great state, including Austin, the capital city where I live and work. Again, this year, AARP Texas is bringing opportunities to our members and others through virtual events just like this one that we're participating in today. We hope you have the opportunity to enjoy these free offerings. Not only are there programs to help unpaid family caregivers, but there are presentations to help people avoid being victims of fraud. We host fitness seminars and we work with city leaders towards making this an even more age-friendly community. And know this, volunteers are critical for our mission. There are many opportunities for those who can give a little time to volunteer. You can learn more about these local happenings at aarp.org slash tx or find us at the AARP Texas Facebook page. But again, of course, family caregiving is a priority. There are 48 million family caregivers in the U.S., 3.4 million in Texas alone. They provide help to loved ones, usually a parent, spouse, or sibling. Caregiving can be anything from driving a loved one to a doctor's appointment, making sure bills are paid, cleaning the house, or helping bathe and dress, and many caregivers do fairly complex medical tasks. Caregivers come from every generation, from Gen Z to the silent generation, in every racial and ethnic group. And you know, most of us will either be a caregiver or need care at some point during our lives. AARP recently released new research on how much family caregivers spend out of their own pockets to care for a loved one. We found that almost every caregiver spends money on caregiving, and about 8 in 10 routinely spend their own money on caregiving. The average amount that caregivers spend each year is $7,240. That's more than a fourth of their household income on average. Housing expenses like rent or mortgage payments, assisted living and home modifications make up more than half of caregiver spending, followed by medical expenses. Caregivers also experience indirect financial setbacks, often postponing their own personal savings for retirement. But I am here to tell you there's action that can help. Congress is considering a bipartisan bill called the Credit for Caring Act, which would create a tax credit of up to $5,000 for working family caregivers. This could help offset some of those major expenses that we know caregivers are facing. AARP, along with 80 other organizations, endorse the Credit for Caring Act. Family caregivers are the backbone of our long-term care system that they are breaking under the pressure. Creating a tax credit for family caregivers is one way that Congress can help. If you would like to learn more about the Credit for Caring Act, visit aarp.org slash caregiving. There you will also find many resources available for family caregivers just like you. So again, that's aarp.org slash caregiving. Thank you for listening. Again, I'm Jessica Lemon with AARP Texas, and thank you for all that you do as family caregivers or to support caregivers. 
Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. My name is Rob Fobion, and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications for Age of Central Texas, and it is our pleasure to welcome you to our eighth annual Williamson County Caregiver Conference. We're so glad that you're here this morning because we have a fantastic presentation today and all this week as we discuss caregiving in the new normal. We all know that caregiving is already a very difficult journey and with everything that has happened in the world over the past two years, it has made it even more difficult for us. And so we're gonna tackle some of those issues this week. Before we get started this morning, I wanted to go over some very quick housekeeping issues. Number one, we are recording this session, so if for any reason you have a technical issue at home or you need to leave before we're done, don't worry. We are recording the session and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel later this week. And in fact, at the end of the week, we're going to send you a link of a sorry, a list of all the links to all the presentations for this week, including all the support materials for each of the presentations as well. Speaking of items that were sent to you in your reminder emails, you got a link to our conference program. We hope that you will take a look at that because not only does it have great information on all of our sponsors and uh, all of our speakers, but we also curated some wonderful caregiver resources for you. And so those are included in the program. So we hope that you take a look at your program when you have a chance. Finally, there is a chat feature here on Zoom. It's located right down here at the bottom of the window. It looks like one of those thought bubbles that you see in the cartoons. We want you to click on that. And during our presentation today, we want you to ask your questions because this is why we do these seminars. It is for you. And we want you to be able to ask your questions of the experts that we have with us this week so that you can get the answers to help you in your caregiving journey. So during our presentation today, be sure and ask your questions. And at the end of the presentation, we are going to answer all of your questions. Now we are gonna be very cognizant of your time. We said we were gonna end at 11.30 and that's what we're going to do. So if for some reason we don't get to every question this morning, don't worry, we are still going to answer your questions. We will contact you directly after we finish with today's program with the answers to your questions. And then one last thing, later at the end of the, all of our sessions, we're going to send you a survey. It'll be an electronic survey, very simple, very quick, but we ask you to please complete that for us because it helps us in planning for next year's conference. We want to know what are some of the issues that you are dealing with as a caregiver so that we can find the experts to give those presentations for you next year. So please give us your opinions with that survey. We would really appreciate it. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Lynn Hartchie is a licensed professional counselor. He works with Blue Bonnet Trails Community Services. That is our local mental health authority. He graduated from Texas A&M University and is currently a clinical consultant leading the criminal incident response team and critical incident stress management team. And he provides critical training for teams across the entire state of Texas. Lynn was in private practice for 20 years before he started his career with Blue Bonnet Trails, and he has chaired and served on a number of statewide committees and boards, including the Texas Council of Community Services, Behavioral Health Directors Consortium, United Way of North Central Texas, the NAMI Board of Directors, Homeward Bound Homeless Coalition, and many others. He is a certified mental health first aid for youth, adults, and law enforcement, uh, applied suicide intervention skills training, as well as clinical services, mentoring, and training. Lynn has extensive experience when it comes to helping us deal with the stress in our lives. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about putting on your oxygen mask first. So Lynn, I'm going to let you unmute and I'm going to turn it over to you. And I thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, today, folks, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be running pretty quickly. 
uh, because we have a lot of things that I think will be helpful, I hope will be helpful for you. And, uh, and at any point, please, uh, as Rob said, uh, please jot down any questions or concerns that you might have uh, in the chat feature. And then uh, either myself or Rob or some of the staff there will get back with you as, uh, as we try to help uh, you navigate uh, the circumstances that you're uh, experiencing now in your roles. So the, the uh, resilience aspect of, of our presentation today uh, is, is, I think, uh, a timely uh, concept because we want to be able to bounce back, right, from those things that we encounter uh, that stress us, that give us uh, challenges and so forth. And, and I would uh, kind of mark for us at the very beginning that when we get on an airplane and we uh, are ready to take a trip, one of the first things that we do is the, the, the uh, flight attendant comes on the mic uh, microphone and says, uh, you know, if we lose cabin pressure, uh, there's going to be oxygen masks that fall from the uh, area above your head. And uh, we really recommend if you have children or other, uh, or other uh, folks uh, who are not able to do that for themselves, put your oxygen mask on first. And, and that's going to be kind of the core of what we're talking about today. If you don't take care of yourselves uh, as well as you're possibly capable of, then chances are you're not going to be as effective as a caregiver as what uh, you're capable of being. So with that said, uh, we're going to uh, move in uh, for some reason. My slide advance is not working here. Let's see what I've got. It's not advancing. So let's see here if I click on that, if that will. Ah, here we go. So three objectives today that we're going to uh, try to, to, to meet. One is to recognize what where stress is in your life, right? Uh, most of us are aware generally of stressors that come along, but sometimes we don't really take the time to articulate them, to really uh, take a look at them, to unpack them at, at times. We just we just become uh, used to them, right? Uh, we're, we're used to living stressful lives and we just kind of ignore them as best we're able. That's our strategy. And I'm going to suggest to us today that that strategy is not the best one uh, for us. Uh, the second objective is to learn some skills. Uh, we're going to put a different uh, term on that in just a minute, but to build on those strengths which result in resilience. Uh, we want you also in the third objective to feel appreciated for what you do for persons in your lives uh, for whom you care. Uh, nothing is more important, I think, in our current uh, environment, if you will, the complex environment that we find ourselves uh, that, that wouldn't appreciate all the efforts that you take. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, identifying what stress is, okay? So stress is that physiological function that puts a demand on our internal physiological resources. Mm -hmm. uh, if you encounter a situation uh, in traffic, for instance, uh, and you, you become heightened in your uh, in your response, uh, maybe you have some adrenaline rush, that sort of thing, that's stress, and that costs you life energy. Uh, we take in food in the morning, and in the, e in the midday, and, and in the evening, and at night, as our body uh, processes that food, then we have a certain amount of fuel for us for the next day, right? And when we aren't efficient in the use of that fuel uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, then that's when stress can take a, uh, a really challenging and negative impact on, on how we uh, are, are efficient with that energy that we have for each day. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that just like in your automobile, uh, there is a limited supply on any given day. Sometimes we go into our reserves, right? And that's the resilience piece of this. That's why for caregivers, especially for you guys that take such good care of the folks in your care, 
Uh, one of the things that we know is that you need to be as efficient as possible so that, that you can stretch that, uh, that energy and those life resources uh, to, to stretch not, over, not only on yourself, but also to those other folks uh, uh, for whom you take some level of care. So what uh, typically causes stress when we get angry, right? I know that driving in this morning, there was a guy that cut in front of me on 35 as I was coming south from Georgetown. Uh, and I will tell you that was a little bit stressful. I've learned, and I'm sure you have too, that it's probably not prudent to, you know, to put your finger up in the air and, and, and respond to that angrily because you never know what you're going to get back, right? Uh, so, so we have to kind of uh, suck it in. Right, we have to just kind of accept that. It will let's part of the traffic in a in a, uh, con a congested uh, traffic system. Sometimes it's frustration. I, I need to do certain things. I uh, and and I'm not able to either. I don't have the resources, external or internal resources, to complete those things that I want to accomplish. So we feel frustrated. Anxiety. Um, anxiety is a is a very natural and normal extension of of uh, stress. Uh, for human beings. It, when I begin to feel anxious about something like I did just now when my uh, slide advancer wasn't working for a minute, uh, uh, I, I do something to manage that anxiety, right? And if it's present a lot, that's when it can become, or if it's coming from multiple places. Uh, I know in the last year and a half to two years with the, uh, uh, the, the uh, onset of the pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, viruses that have kind of uh, gone like wildfire throughout our, our uh, nation and the, uh, and the world, um, it's, it's been stressful because you want to avoid getting really sick. And certainly those of us who take care of other people recognize the, the uh, concerns that are legitimate uh, for uh, those people who have compromised immune systems, for instance. So we want to be real mindful of the fact that that stress is always present. And therefore, we need to really manage that stress as best we can. I'm going to suggest that we manage that intentionally, that we, number one, become aware of the stress, that it is uh, significant in our lives. And, and also, number three, that uh, it's something that we can get control over. So please be aware that these are things that we can take uh, control over. And that's what we're going to be talking today. So using the chat feature, if you would, share with us and each other those aspects of things that create stress in your life. What are, and when you think about, okay, what's, what's stressful for me? Well, uh, if I have to fight traffic every day, if I have to take care of mom or dad or Aunt Sadie uh, or Uncle Saul, uh, what, are, what of those things are stressful? I'm going to suggest to you that in point of fact, uh, all of that is stressful and it impacts our lives at, a, at an energy consuming level, right? So as you identify those things that are stressful, what we want to do is build some resi resiliency uh, building uh, strategies into our uh, processes, our day-to-day -day life uh, experiences, so that we mitigate or, or minimize the negative impact from those things. Mm -hmm. So chronic stress, I think we could all agree, is not a good thing. Uh, typically, periods of chronic stress changes our brain functionality. So we uh, tend to, when we're under great levels of stress and unremitting stress, we tend to act with our emotions. We tend to feel that anger. We tend to feel, uh, and not that that's an inappropriate thing. Anger is, is there for a reason, right? It helps us stay safe. Um, also, uh, anxiety is, is there for a reason. It helps us uh, be aware of our environment and, and, and to take uh, whatever steps are necessary to protect ourselves, whether it's emotionally, physically, or whatever, right? Uh, but we want to be able to also balance that out, if you would, uh, with the, with the uh, cognitive thinking skills. So when I, uh, when I begin to 
emote all the time or, or, or experience a, a strong emotion all the time, and I'm not thinking through, then we lose that balance. And, and uh, that's, that's one of the things that, that I want us to be mindful of. Short-term stressors can be beneficial. Uh, beneficial, uh, like uh, as as uh, something comes along in my uh, if my air conditioning system goes out, which it has done here at our admin building in Round Rock. We're fixing to get uh, do some some uh, uh, physical changes to the building here, and uh, uh, for whatever reason, I think the AC people. So it's a little bit warm. I may shed my jacket here shortly, if that's okay with everybody, hopefully so. Uh, but uh, short-term stressors can be beneficial. It can tell me, okay, Lynn, you're going to probably overheat if you don't take your coat off, right? And at that point, at this point, I'm not uh, ready to do that. Uh, Longer-term or chronic stress can have significant impact in our lives as well. Chronic stress can increase the size. It's, it's like uh, if we are going to the uh, gym, if we're going to uh, work out and that sort of thing. If, if I work out only my uh, right bicep, I, I use a dumbbell and just lift my right arm, then chances are probably not for me because my muscles don't get big <laughs> that, that easily. But if I just uh, exercise my right uh, bicep, it's maybe going to get a little bit bigger, right? If I never exercise my left bicep, guess what? It's going to stay smaller. It, it might, be, through disuse, uh, even get smaller. And that's what I want to mark for us right now. Chronic stress can increase the size of the amygdala, that part of our brain that's fight, flight, or freeze, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, emits, if you will, endorphins uh, and uh, uh, things like... Um, having a senior moment here, uh, the, when something scares me, I have adrenaline rush. Uh, and, and that, that takes, it takes a huge amount of energy uh, to, to create it or, or produce adrenaline for me. And then our body has to reuptake that. It has to build it, uh, it has to build it up in order for me to have all the, the blood and the, the energy going to my muscles to help me run. Uh, and, and then when it's done, I don't need that anymore, right? So the body has to break it, uh, break it back down into its component parts. So that's part of the, 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 uh, the, you, the uh, uh, part of the amygdala that, that helps us stay alive, right? Uh, and then as we, as that gets broken down, we have access to our uh, thinking, the prefrontal cortex, uh, if you will. So if I'm always in that, uh, in the exercise, if you will, of the amygdala, then chances are that's going to get stronger and I'm going to tend to emotionally respond, uh, not in a balanced situation, but, it, but in an imbalance. And I'm not going to be as likely to think through those things. So we need to be intentional when we think through things as things get stressful for us. So that's the solution to managing stress in our lives, to keep us productive and to keep us as, as efficient and as effective as, as we possibly can. So how do we inoculate ourselves from that? I'm going to submit to you that we want to inoculate mm -hmm. ourselves or vaccinate ourselves in a, in a symbolic way by prescribing ourselves the following things. Play. Play is regenerative. It's recreational, recreation, right? Uh, we want to avail ourselves where we can fit it into our uh, busy schedules, entertainment. What is entertaining and enjoyable for you? That builds up resilience. Exercise, especially exercise that's enjoyable. And again, exercise can be enjoyable if we think about that as an enjoyable experience. If we think, if we think about it as, as, um, as drudgery or, oh, I have to do this, I have to do my stomach crunches, I have to do this or that, then chances are it's not going to be as enjoyable for us. So we need to begin to, to think about things uh, that we do that are productive and help, healthy for ourselves. We need to think about that as positive experiences. Fun times. Uh, I know that even in bad times for me, I really enjoy the, uh, uh, the times that, that I spend with my family, my extended family, with my colleagues, uh, like my, my colleagues here at Lubonnet Trails. 
uh, and and uh, throughout my community, my neighborhood, and so forth. Fun times are extremely helpful uh, for that. Friends, family interactions, all of those things are, uh, are, are extremely helpful to help us keep our lives in balance. Resilience, therefore, is the ability to withstand adversity and to bounce back from difficult life experiences. Resilient people tap into their strengths and support systems to overcome those adversities, helping them work through those challenges. That's what we're going to really be talking about today, how we find that balance in our lives so that as our life energy on any given day is consumed by those for whom we care, uh, we also have enough left at the end of that proverbial day to also feed ourselves and to build our own resilience. So when we think about uh, the things that are helpful for us, we want to think about this almost like we would a tire on our automobile. Uh, when we think about, when I think about my, I, I use my, I have a truck, uh, I just recently got a, a kind of a cool, fun uh, Jeep truck uh, that I use to, to, to when, I, when I go to uh, do kayaking and camping and hiking and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and the tires on that uh, are, are a pretty important part of the function because if I'm off road uh, uh, trying to drive down to a river or a creek or something like that, I need to rely on those tires. And, and if they don't work for me, guess what? I'm, I'm likely to be stuck somewhere. Uh, and, and, and when we think about the, the elements of what keeps our lives in balance, I want us to kind of think about that metaphorically. So these are the, the uh, five things that, that we're going to be looking at today throughout our, our uh, time together. Uh, let's take a look at safety first. When we think about our hierarchy of needs, uh, we think first of safety and what, what's uh, encompassed with safety. Well, it's our ability to feed ourselves, to house uh, ourselves, to keep ourselves cool and or warm as appropriate. Those things of basic human needs uh, that provide uh, for us on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would submit to you that equally important is our times of serenity, uh, those times of calmness, of, of uh, peace that we might seek for ourselves. That's an important part. If I don't have that calmness, that, san that, that uh, uh, sanctuary, uh, however we want to uh, conceive of that, then chances are I'm not going to be in, in good balance in my life. And connectedness. Uh, we are human. Uh, we are, are human beings who rely on one another. We don't just rely on ourselves. I don't. Uh, I don't uh, manufacture the gasoline that I put in my Jeep. I don't uh, cook most of the food. I have a garden at my house. Uh, I live on a small farm in oatmeal. Uh, I have a garden there, and, and uh, but but I don't always uh, cook all, or, or grow all of my food. In fact, I grow very little of it. So I have to depend on HEB or wherever I buy my uh, groceries. Self and community efficacy. What is efficacy? That's our ability to interact with our, our community, our world, the, the, the areas that we live in effectively. So, uh, and, and, and within myself, uh, do I manage my own internal resources, whether it's emotional or physical, do I manage that well? So that's an important part of our life circle or our life ring, if you will. And then last but not least is hope. Uh, when I lose hope, uh, then I've lost an important part of how I keep my life in balance. So I would submit to you as we think about our work together today and through this conference, I would really like for you to keep in mind how each of these things that we're looking at as we look for management principles, for, uh, for strategies, for managing your lives and, and the lives of others uh, who depend on you, think about it as, as, a, as a life ring, okay? So if we were to think about the specific strategies, the, uh, the, the uh, steps, if you will, uh, the first thing that we're going to do today is we're going to look at information gathering and prioritizing that information. Uh, we have tons of, of, of uh, uh, stimuli or input coming in from us, uh, into us all the time. 
Uh, and, and we're going to look at a method of, of, of kind of doing that inventory that we started out with today uh, to see what is important, what we might need to focus on uh, to build some resilience back into our lives. We're going to talk about also managing reactions. Uh, the reactions that, you know, you know we're going to talk some more about this, but how we, how we think about what it is that we do is just as important as, and perhaps even more so sometimes, as how we feel about it. So finding that balance, too, is important. Our social supports, as we said before, uh, are incredibly important to us. And if we have some deficits in that area, we might want to focus on that as a way of building that resilience. Helpful thinking, again, how we think about things, you know, that glass half empty, glass half full thing, you know, we do have some controls over that and how we solve problems. Uh, I doubt that there are very many of us on this conference today who uh, don't in one way or the other have problems from from time to time. And we have to come up with a, with a method or a, or a strategy to solve those things. Positive activities, I would submit to you, are at the center of all of this. Uh, if we never have or, or avail ourselves of positive activities, I think we miss a very important part of, of that resilience cycle. So these are the things that we're going to be talking about. And, and, and the other thing that I would mark for us is that we're going to call these uh, if you will, protective factors. And our number one protective factor today is, is that gathering information or that doing a self inventory, uh, which is intentionally taking the time to review and determine where we are in our lives right now. Are there things that if I looked at them a little bit differently, if I did things a little bit differently, that my life might be uh, uh, more impactful for others, and more importantly, more resilient for myself to where I have enough energy, life energy in any given day to not only take care of those people uh, for whom I uh, am partially or perhaps totally responsible, but also the responsibility of putting my own oxygen mask on first. So why is it important? Because after periods of, of sustained stress, and I'm going to tell you folks, in the last year and a half, we think we can think about the stressors that we all have had. Unless you live in a hole in the ground, you know that we're in a, a, a pandemic of major proportions right now. Uh, we, in addition, we have political divisions in our nation, in our society, in our state, sometimes even in our communities uh, that are profound and, and uh, exist uh, at, at, at very much a bifurcated level. Uh, there are two sides and, and almost nothing in the, in the middle. And there's a lot of pressure on us to pick and, and choose a side. And there's a lot of rationale that people will give us. The talking heads on TV, uh, on, on our news, they're always uh, ready to, to pull us into one camp or the other uh, or, or one uh, block of vote. Uh, of voters as opposed to the other. That's stressful. Uh, we had over the winter last night, uh, gosh, I really hope that we don't have that again this year. We had a terrible ice storm here in, uh, in Texas that, that produced a great deal of, uh, of distress and stress for people for days and days and days that lasted well beyond the event itself. So all of those things were layers of stress, and that's on top of everything else that we deal with, our emotional uh, uh, stressors and, and caregiver stressors of every day. So because of that, uh, we, it makes it even more uh, important for us to really manage those things well. So how do we identify those problem areas? Number one, let's look at our physical health. You know, if we don't take care of our bodies, our bodies aren't going to take care of us. Uh, how we, the things that we eat, the things that we do, I, I'm a firm believer in getting uh, fairly good cardio, even if I'm, even though I'm a, a fairly old person, I get out and I do a lot every day. I do a lot of, 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 uh, of getting my heart rate up, right? And I always feel better after. Do I feel tired? Yeah, a little bit, but I also feel a lot better because the positive endorphins 
endorphins that are released when I get exercise, my mental health, am I good, taking good care of myself? Am I, uh, if I'm feeling depressed sometimes, do I externalize that? Do I uh, sit down with my wife or, or, or my buddy, Jeff? Uh, do, do I talk about those things that might uh, be challenging for me? I hope so. Uh, am I taking good care of myself safe, uh, from a safety standpoint? Basic necessities, substance use or abuse. Uh, do I rely on things uh, that are not helpful to my body uh, in order to change my mood? I hope that that's not something that we fall into and, and many people do. Emotional distress. Well, we've already identified multiple sources of emotional distress. Current adversities, they're there every day if we really focus on them. Uh, our role functioning, we function as, uh, I function as a husband, uh, as a colleague, uh, as a dad, as a granddad, uh, and as a brother, uh, uh, and, and so forth. And those are all important roles for me. How am I doing with those? Uh, our interpersonal, uh, our interpersonal uh, uh, life uh, with our family and communities, uh, those are, are all important things for us to be mindful of. The religious and spiritual issues, we need a place uh, oftentimes. If that's important to you, uh, that faith community can be extremely uh, helpful. So first thing that we want to do is summarize or make a list of those things that might be challenging for us. We prioritize that. We determine what skills we might need. And then we act on the information that we gather. So when we go to that list, and I would really suggest that you get a pad and, and paper and just write down those things that really aren't, uh, aren't great for you right now. Uh, identify those things that you most want to address, the things you think are most significant, that are causing serious distress or impairment in your roles and so forth that need to be addressed sooner are worsening over time or, or will reduce other problems if addressed. Okay, those are all strategies that we can use. So we might, this might be an example of, of a problem list. What's most troublesome, what's moderately troublesome, minimally, and then least troublesome. Once we get that done, then at the very, what the things that weigh the most for us or are most weighted for us that need to be uh, dealt with, then we put our attention to that, take care of that thing, and then we go to the next uh, most stressful uh, or significant uh, stressor. Another way to look at this is how's your five? How's your work? How's your love? How's your play? How's your sleep? How's your eat? Each of those are, are, are serious components of, uh, of the things that we want to be uh, uh, mindful of, okay? Protective factor number two, problem solving skills. So how do we focus actively on a problem? We think of ideas that might help resolve or reduce significance, right? So uh, there's some problems that just aren't gonna go away. If I have uh, X number of dollars that come into my, uh, 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 my uh, checking account every month and I have to budget uh, for things that I want that, that are extra budgetary, right? Uh, then I may have to, to set aside some dollars over the space of two or three, maybe six months so that I can get those things that are important to me. And then I can have access to whatever that is, whether it's a vacation or, or maybe a new car or something like that or, uh, or, or something for the house, uh, then I can plan for that so that it doesn't uh, put me into a bad place with my budget, that I'm not overextending myself, right? So we think of ideas that might help us resolve or reduce that significance. We take whatever those actions are and go forward. We put our actions into motion, I, into action. Uh, I will tell you that we can think about these things all day, but if we don't do something different, uh, if we don't act and do something different, then we're uh, likely to kind of stay stuck. And that's not a good place to be. So understanding our stress-induced challenges are important because it reduces our life quality. It reduces our ability to uh, uh, effectively and efficiently take care of family members and our workplaces. Uh, it reduces our willingness, our energy to invest in self-care. 
and it sometimes can continue uh, traumatic stress reactions. Uh, I, I will tell you that, that uh, the political uh, things that occurred back in January were incredibly stressful. I found myself uh, watching a lot of news and I would watch two or three news reports every day. And what I realized, I was kind of feeling bad. And what I recognized, fortunately for me, fairly quickly, is that I needed to put myself on a diet. Uh, I'm a skinny guy. I'm going to probably always be a skinny guy. Uh, and I'm not used to being on a diet, but I absolutely needed to put myself on a diet of hearing all that negative stuff day in and day out. It was, it was kind of pulling me down. And, and that's the, an example of continuation of traumatic stress. We are, visual, we are right now on the, on the south border of our state, uh, uh, witness to many people who are traumatized uh, as they fled uh, their countries of origin and, and are showing up at the great United States to find a place to live uh, where they can be safe and have all these needs we've been talking about met. Uh, and they're met with, with rejection. I'm not going to make a, a political comment about that, except that we're viewing that. We see that happening, the children that are being carried on their parents' back. I mean, that's painful for me to see. Uh, and, and realizing what they've had to go uh, to get to the Rio Grande. So those are all things that, that can continue our, our uh, emotional distress. So our steps here are to define the problem, decide ownership, set appropriate goals, brainstorm solutions, and I'm really a strong believer in that, and then evaluate and select that preferred solution process and I'm going to underscore activity that needs to occur. So what bothers me the most right now? How often does it happen? Who's involved? How do I, how do I feel when I experience that situation? And how does it impact my lives, my life and the lives of other people uh, for whom I care? So the first thing here is decide ownership. Is this something that's happening between me and somebody else? Then I have standing right? If it is mainly happening to other people or between two other people, then I may not have the standing. I need to be able to, I need to be able to focus on those things that I am actually involved with. Sometimes we involve ourselves in relationships that, uh, over which we have no control. And then we may just need to recognize, you know, that's between them. Uh, and I'm going to let that go because I can't uh, make those kinds of decisions for other people. That can be uh, uh, all subsumed under that heading of decide, deciding ownership. So we want to specify those needs in a concrete way. What's achievable? What can actually be accomplished here? If it's all pie in the sky and something I never have control over, then I need to begin to uh, accept that that's not something that I can fix. And then any complex problem, we break that down into chunks. We've all heard the saying, how do you eat an elephant one step at a time? Then we brainstorm the possibilities. I know we're moving fast here, but we have a lot to cover. Uh, we identify as many solutions as we can and write them down. Uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes, and I do this, uh, Jeff and I uh, do this training, ex except in a, in a five or six hour uh, training segment, we do this very thing that we're doing today uh, uh, for people. And, uh, and I always use an example, you know, when uh, we're going to a training or doing a training, I'll sometimes say, well, I wonder what Jeff would do. Uh, and, and, and I can talk to Jeff. And sometimes that kind of clears some of the brain fog that we experience when we're too close to a situation. And then uh, we also want to be mindful of thinking through all the way through to that potential outcome and it's perhaps wanted or unwanted uh, uh, consequences. And then when you have enough practical, good options, then you choose one and implement it. So once you've done that, then consider what worked well, review the steps that you took. If you hit a snag, look for ways around it. Just because we hit a blind alley, Smart people, resilient people never give up uh, when it's something that I need to address. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to do a workaround, find a way to that. And then we reflect always on the opportunity to grow through the things that we're challenged with. I would submit to you that what doesn't break us makes us stronger. Uh, it's at that point of being broken sometimes that we find ourselves the strongest. 
protective factor number three, uh, number three is increasing positive activities. Positive activities help us feel more in control of our life and that life is more normal. Positive activities for me are, are kayaking. Some people, I, my wife is a good example, don't want to be anywhere around uh, any water that's that's deeper than than knee deep. Uh, but so that wouldn't be fun for her. She has opted not to ever go kayaking with me and my buddies, uh, right? Uh, so the things that are important to me, uh, they help me feel less sad, more hopeful. And I can tell you that at the end of a run, even if it's an all day long run, I feel incredibly energized, even though I'm absolutely worn out. It's amazing how that works. Uh, th these things encourage us when we feel overwhelmed uh, to make uh, time to do things that improve our general health and well-being. When we stop doing rewarding things, it's because we're too busy coping with other priorities. We have to make priorities to ourselves. Uh, sometimes we just don't feel like doing anymore. And that's a good, uh, that's a marker for us that we've overextended ourselves and we're burning that proverbial candle at both ends. We need to step back and do that inventory and, and remove from those things that are consuming our energy uh, where we can. We try also to, re, uh, to avoid reminders of negative things that have happened. Uh, and sometimes people just become sound, uh, that sad, down, and apathetic when they no longer do rewarding or meaningful activities. I would submit that that's an easy one of those negative feedback loops that we can, can get into and we can intentionally get out of. So in terms of uh, problems with focusing on changing feelings. I think I've got a slide out of, uh, out of sequence here. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say this since it's right here. Uh, when we uh, think about positive activities here, uh, it, it's how we think about those that, that are extremely important. Feelings are difficult to change. Uh, that's just the truth of it all. Uh, telling ourselves to feel better is, is not going to work. It's easier for us and more humanly possible for us to change our behaviors, which in turn, I guarantee you will change your feelings. Okay, so in this three, uh, this triangular uh, uh, feedback, if you will, behaviors change thoughts, thoughts change feelings, and feelings change behaviors. So the thing is that the takeaway here is that it's all interactive and I am most able to change things that are important at that behavioral change. I can tell you that if I'm tired or, or, or really exhausted mentally or emotionally, uh, then the best thing that I can do is get out and, and do a brisk walk around my little farm. Okay, and, and, and go out and feed the koi or, or work in my garden. And guess what? I feel better all at that, all, all at once. Even if I'm a little bit physically tired, I feel more emotionally uh, in good shape. So if we think about these two glasses here, if we're always putting the disaster, pouring it into our, the, the glass of our lives, then that's what we get, that, that dark, that kind of muddy looking uh, life uh, uh, visual uh, uh, vision of our, our lives. But if we put music, play, uh, uh, sports, those things that, that create happiness for us, then we have that clarity and we see life more clearly and positively. How do I do this? We identify and plan more activities. We schedule in in the calendar. I know my wife is, is a big proponent of this. It doesn't get put on the calendar, then chances are something can come along and, and, uh, uh, and, and make us, uh, we get to do it. We do it because we put it in our calendar. We schedule activities in that calendar as a way of getting us unstuck. Uh, this is the negative feedback loop. I feel depressed, exhausted, drained, which immobilizes me. I feel guilty for, not indul uh, for indulging myself. And then I have no motivation for activities. We have to intentionally stop that cycle, okay? So activities also, you know, during this pandemic and all that sort of thing, they may not be as enjoyable as before, uh, but we get out there and we do them in any way. Okay, it's still important to do them. And then each time we do them, it gets a little bit easier. I promise you that's the case. Uh, it's validating to understand that it's been a trying time by, by uh, scheduling special family activities where we can. 
uh, choose activities that you would enjoy, uh, that you would actually do, and can be set up fairly easy, uh, easily that are practical, okay? Protective factor number four, managing reactions. Develop effective skills to calm upsetting physical and emotional reactions. The thing that I like to use here uh, in terms of an example are, are uh, other, you guys are heroes to us. Uh, you, the, you know, when you're taking care of the folks that, that you take care of, you're our nation's uh, salt of the earth heroes. But another group of those folks are, are returning service people. Uh, those folks who've uh, perhaps been in combat situations in the, in the uh, uh, more unsettled uh, parts of our world. And when they come back, sometimes if they've been traumatized uh, by roadside uh, bombs or something like that, they come back with PTSD, right? Uh, so that person can be driving down uh, 29, which is one of the thoroughfares that I'm on, or 183 or, or, or even 35, and they see a bag of trash that the uh, county trustees have, have picked up and left in bags on the side of the road. They see that and it triggers something for them, right? So they have to, uh, uh, sometimes when they're freshly back, uh, they uh, will perhaps uh, travel off the road because they're afraid that's an uh, improvised explosive device. It's just an automatic uh, reaction that they have. So the things that they have to do is develop strategies to, to uh, adjust to that, right? And that way uh, we can uh, move on the, beyond that. Uh, so, and, and it's just a reminder, right? That, that red plastic bag of trash on the side of the road or litter on the side of the road is nothing but a reminder. It's not gonna blow up uh, here in the United States, at least we hope it does. Uh, so distressing reactions are things that affect our mood, our decision-making, our relationships, our daily functioning, and ultimately our health. And those things can be like uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, anger, irritability, sleeping is an important part of the life balance that we have. Our reactions to chronic stress, that's what we're talking about today, being depressed, having our mood kind of suppressed, and so forth. Uh, these are post-disaster fears, uh, also uh, present in many of and most of our lives, grief reactions, the aftermath of, of the, the winter disaster and so forth, drug and alcohol problems, those are all things that we have to be uh, mindful of to manage. We recognize and manage those reactions in this way. When we're triggered, our internal, our thoughts, memories, feelings, sometimes even body memories can come back if we've been uh, physically assaulted or, or, damaged or hurt in some way. And then external, those stressful situations and reminders of them, like we were just talking about with the returning veterans. Learn how to, learning how to cope with them helps us uh, gain, gain control over our, um, uh, our uh, triggers. So we recognize the, tr uh, the uh, trigger situation, we recognize how it's different from the actual disaster as a reminder, and we identify uh, those strategies to use before, during, and after a trigger. So again, we tell ourselves this is just a reminder. It's not the event itself, it's a reminder of it. We have realistic expectations. This is not gonna change overnight. Uh, we reassure ourselves that we've gotten through it before we, we survived the initial uh, situation. And by golly, we can survive the memory of that as well. Uh, where we need to, we externalize that by putting our words into strong emotions, uh, putting words to those strong emotions, either in writing or working through with a friend. Uh, and writing often puts uh, these feelings into words that help us balance that cognitive and emotional, that amygdala and cognitive processing uh, uh, balance that we seek in our lives. So we get support from others. It's okay to do that. It's okay to, to, to let people listen to us also. Uh, we find those people who are good at doing that. Some people are fed uh, by listening to others and, and giving them those supports. We remind ourselves that we've mastered the situation in the past where we need it and it's available to us. We uh, avail ourselves of those faith, uh, those faith communities uh, and those spiritual practices. Uh, we review our personal strengths. We survived this before. I'll survive the memory of it. 
we use humor. Humor is one of the best uh, medicines that I've ever encountered in my entire career, including those times when I was doing uh, intensive psychotherapy with individuals who had been traumatized in their lives. Relaxation strategies. I wish we'd had time uh, to do this in this presentation, but, but we've got too much to cover. But deep breathing exercises can be incredibly stressful. Just taking that deep breath and letting it out can literally relax the muscles, which makes us feel better. And then helpful thinking. Uh, let's look at stress-related thoughts uh, right now and how they affect our feelings and our behavior. Practical, helpful ways of thinking about stressful-related uh, experiences are incredibly uh, good at being that protective factor. It's helpful thinking, positive thinking, isn't, is, is way too simplistic. Uh, negative thoughts can be and often are accurate. So if I feel, if I get into out of my car at night in a dark parking lot, then negative thoughts are probably appropriate for me because I want to have my, my protective uh, uh, sensorium geared to uh, protecting myself, that fight or flight if I needed to, right? So just having a negative thought in and of itself isn't bad, but, and then helpful thoughts can mobilize and energize. I can run pretty fast if I need to. If somebody came after me with a stick, I guarantee you, I, I may not be the fastest person on the planet, but I, my adrenaline would fuel me and I could probably get away from somebody even now at this stage of my life. Consider the effect of thoughts on your feelings and your behaviors. Those are things we're gonna be thinking about. Chronic stress can change our thought about the world and ourselves. The world is stressful. It's unpredictable. Sometimes it's even dangerous. We trouble. Uh, we have trouble sometimes uh, trusting other people, and we see personal uh, situations as hopeless. I'm going to suggest to you that there's always hope. That we always have to maintain an awareness of hope. If we think about that. That uh, uh, if we think about that that life uh, ring or that safety ring that uh, we looked at earlier. That's one of the things that's a key part of it. Uh, I'm also uh, reminded now uh, that uh, we can kind of slip into that negative feedback loop where if it's bad today, then by golly, it's gonna be bad tomorrow. And I'm gonna suggest to you that when we start thinking about that, we have to intentionally say, but you know what, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna choose to do something differently there. So those are the things that we can intentionally do to change our, our, uh, our approach to life and our ability to find that hope and, and uh, the, the things that are gonna help us be successful. It's important to focus on helpful ways of thinking, which then improves our mood and our ability uh, to adapt or cope uh, through things that might uh, be uh, present in our lives. So this is a common negative thought. I should be coping better. And the, the uh, let's see if I can move this out of the way so I can see this. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in this, uh, then the resulting emotion for I should be coping better is feeling hopeless, incompetent, or fearful, right? So let's think about an alternative helpful thought. The fact that I came here today or that I'm here in this conference says I'm coping a bit. Talking to a counselor says I'm coping better than many others. I would submit to you that you are coping just by being here. Uh, most people will have trouble after uh, the, the events that we've experienced in our lives recently, right? The new emotional response by changing that thought is that we're less fearful, we're less helpless because we're doing something proactive to make our situation better. And we're oriented to seeking and supporting the help that we might need. That's why you're here today. So we would move from, I should be coping better to, you know what, I'm not coping so bad because I'm availing myself of obvious, uh, of the opportunities now to re-envision how I'm taking care of myself. So a second uncommon helpful thought, unhelpful thought, a common unhelpful thought is that my reactions mean I'm going crazy. Something must really be wrong with me. That results in that fear, low self-esteem, and pessimism, right? These 
And then the alternative or helpful thought is these reactions are only temporary. This is something that I can have some control over. Most people have these reactions after a disaster or after chronic stress, okay? Then I'm reassured, you know, I'm not alone in this and there are people who can help me and I can ultimately help myself. That leaves me feeling reassured and with an intact self-esteem. So other people are dealing with this better than I am. So what's wrong with me? Low self-esteem. Most people react the way I do for a while. Uh, my reaction reflects how big this, these events are, not how weak I am. I will tell you that you are not weak. Uh, given what you've uh, survived over the last year and a half, you are anything but weak. And I would love for you to feel more reassured and with that uh, intact self-esteem. So this is, these are some ways of, of moving from unhealthy thinking to uh, helpful thinking in, in your lives. Click on that again to make this work. Okay, so when we identify helpful thoughts, we identify uh, our helpful thoughts. We identify, clarify, write down uh, alternative helpful thoughts. We consider what would be that using your, and these things you're going to be getting in your, uh, uh, the packets that uh, you'll be sent uh, later on in this, uh, at the end of the, our time together today, uh, as you'll, you'll have some worksheets that you can use to kind of work through some of these things. As these helpful thoughts are identified, consider what positive feelings uh, come with each of those alternative uh, thoughts. I'm going to tell you right now, folks, this is one of the most valuable parts of this uh, presentation right now. I will tell you also that like everything else, uh, we're going into football right now. Uh, and I will tell you that the football teams that, that are doing the best are doing the best because they put the work in. Uh, they don't, uh, I will tell you, I never played football. I used to think that I would one day when I grew up and, and got big and strong. Never happened. Uh, but I, I can only imagine how many uh, uh, times you have to practice throwing uh, a 30 or 40 yard pass and connecting with a receiver, knowing where he's going to be on the field at any given time uh, for that to connect. That's hard work. It's hard work to practice that. I'm going to tell you that that hard work pays off with winning, just like our winning football teams do. We practice focusing on those healthy thoughts. When I find myself uh, uh, thinking an unhealthy thought, at that point, I stop that and say, what's a healthy thought right now? Consider those situations which unhelpful thoughts occur most often. Probably when I'm at, at my, uh, the ebb of my, uh, of my energy level. So we want to manage our energy so that we have energy to, to uh, devote to this. Picture some of these situations and practice saying the helpful thought out loud. So here's a, uh, uh, the pros and cons of keeping the thought or changing the thought. We're not going to spend an awful lot of time uh, at going through this right here, but I'm just going to read it through with you if you'll, if you'll forgive me right now. Uh, if I'm going to keep the thought, what way do I, can I determine that holding on to the thought makes the most sense? If I want to change the thought, how could changing that thought improve my life? Okay, the disadvantages then of keeping the thought might be holding on to the thought uh, that makes my life more difficult or less easily uh, acceptable to, to the chores that I have to, to do, the energy that I have on each given day. The disadvantages to changing, uh, what would be the cost of changing that thought? So this is a way of, of kind of looking at this in a, in a uh, two by two uh, format that will give you the pros and cons of, of changing that thinking. There's more to this, and I wish we had a little bit more time to go through it, but we've got to keep moving today. The last uh, protective factor that we're going to talk about today is that rebuilding of social connections. Uh, this seems on the face of it, to be a no-brainer, uh, that everybody knows that we're social beings and, and that uh, the, the better uh, our social connections are, our, our family, our support systems and so forth, uh, the better they are, the, the better the quality of our lives, right? 
But in point of fact, many people are isolated. We're isolated right now because we don't have free uh, movement in our communities, at least not without masking up, if, unless we uh, want to take the chance of, of becoming infected and perhaps affecting other vulnerable individuals. But when we increase our social connections to positive relationships and community supports, we're better off. We are more likely to be resilient and to bounce back. Uh, individuals can feel isolated due to social isolation, fatigue, other things caregivers may typically experience, sadness, fear, lack of motivation, those things we've been talking about today. That, that requires intentional focus so that we change that trajectory, we, re we change that strategy that we've kind of fallen into. We develop, in this case, a social connections map. We're going to see one in just a second. We review it, and then we make a plan. As in each of these uh, uh, empowering points uh, and protective factors, we want to make a plan and go through that. So first thing we want to do is identify who's in our network. Uh, I'll tell you who's in my uh, network. I'm here in the middle in this one. Uh, I've got my neighbors. I've got uh, my friend Jeff, uh, who, who is my... Uh, I'm looking at him here. He's sitting here trying to keep me on, on, on track uh, to keep moving here so we don't run out of time. Uh, Jeff is, is an incredibly good support. Now, don't tell him I said that, uh, but, but he is, he, he's an incredibly uh, uh, thoughtful and caring individual, uh, uh, both in his community and in his, uh, uh, and in his uh, uh, faith community uh, where he's a leader. Uh, I have my son, I have my daughter, I have my grandkids. I don't have my mom by phone or my dad by phone anymore, but in my head I do. They, they've long since gone on, uh, but I can, you know, sometimes I talk to them and I think, what would dad say? Uh, I have cousins, tons of cousins. Uh, I have, uh, I don't have a counselor because uh, my wife has taken on that role or Jeff when he, <laughs> when he feels like he can devote that. Uh, my BFF, uh, my sister, my brother, uh, and, and my faith community, those are all people who are important to me and uh, who feed me, if you will, and, and help me be resilient. So who are those most important connections? Like with everything else, we prioritize that, right? Uh, who can we share our feelings with? Who can we get advice from when we, when we need it? Who do you want to spend time with? Who do you want to spend time with? Uh, who might need your help or your support? Sometimes I know that for me, giving, I get back more than I give every time I give. I love doing things mm -hmm. like this because hopefully uh, for you guys, uh, it'll be helpful. There'll be some insight that you'll gain from this. But when you look at your, you do that social connections mapping, are there types of supports that are missing? Uh, are there uh, individuals who you want to connect uh, with, but who aren't connectable right now? How could that be fixed? Uh, who do you want to spend more time with? Sometimes I'm going to submit to you, there are people that I need to spend less time with because they drain me more than I have energy to budget that, if you will. Uh, are there relationships that you want to improve? How would we go about doing that, right? That's an important thing to be mindful of. What ways do you want to help other people? Do you want to uh, join a community group? I know once my wife retired, she was a, a teacher, a diagnost a, a educational diagnostician in the early years of her career, and then a teacher for the last part, uh, a children's librarian toward the end of her career. And I will tell you that she, after she retired fully, uh, she does Meals on Wheels. She does uh, her, her book club. She does her Friends of the Library. She does all of those things. And that's very important to her. That feeds her. Sometimes those uh, things can be very important and, and uh, can keep us moving up in the world. So again, we identify one or two areas that we want to change. We make a plan, and then again, I'm going to mark this for us. We take actions to fill the gap. So I'm going to bring us back to our life ring, to this. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of when I was in elementary uh, and, and uh, what then was junior high school. I think it's middle school now. But I remember the uh, fire marshal sometimes coming to uh, give us a presentation. And he had 
a, uh, a, a triangular device and it was lit up uh, when the heat, the fuel, and the oxygen was, was all put together, it snapped together. And then in the, in the center of that, there was this fire thing. It, it, it lit up when you, when you had those three components present. Uh, you take any one component off and the fire goes away. So if we remove the fuel, the fire stops. If we take the heat away, the fire stops. If we take oxygen away, the fire stops. You have to have all three. I'm going to submit to you that in our life ring, we need all of these things. We need that, that safety in our lives. We need a place of serenity to rejuvenate ourselves, to recoup those energies that, that, that we've lost. We need connectedness. We need to be there with one another and allow other people to feed us as well. And I'm not talking about donuts. Uh, we need that self-efficacy and community where we get from the community the things that we need. When we don't get or from ourselves, when we're not getting that, we recognize it and we do something about it. We take an action. And at the end of the proverbial day and presentation, I want you to walk away with some level of hope. Hope is the single most precious uh, uh, understanding and belief that we can hold on to. And I want us to be able to go through this uh, with, uh, with the uh, result of, uh, of, our, of our time today. Uh, and, and, and again, let's think about stress and wellness. Stress is a part of our lives. We can't eliminate it, uh, but it is manageable. Awareness is our key. And a dashboard, just like when we're when I'm in my Jeep, I, it's even got one of those things in the uh, in the uh, uh, the the computer screen that that when I'm off road, it will show me whether or not I'm out of balance and if I'm getting too far tilted. I would submit to you that by being aware, that's our dashboard, and and we know when we're getting low on fuel. I'm I fill up about every time I get to the halfway point, just in case I don't get to a diesel place because I have diesel in my Jeep, okay? Uh, and and I, I check my tires, I do all those things because I want to make sure that I'm managing uh, that important part of transportation when I'm in uh, a remote area. So that awareness is the key. Monitor your stress by loading and making a plan to address each of these items that we talked about today. Take your emotional health seriously. It's the right thing to do, folks. Always put your own oxygen mask on first. If we don't, we don't. We cannot be as efficient and as effective uh, with the folks uh, for whom we've assumed or taken uh, a level of responsibility. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the things that you do for other people. And I'm going to thank you in advance for doing a better job of taking care of yourselves. You guys are our heroes in our community and we love you for what you do and we honor and respect that, okay? So I'm gonna turn this back on, uh, back over to Rob. Rob, thank you for the opportunity to visit with your folks today that are absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And thank you so very much, Lynn. We really, really appreciate you taking the time for today and sharing so many wonderful things with us. I'm gonna ask you, uh, Lynn, if you don't mind, stop sharing your screen so that everybody can see us for some Q&A. Um, you know, you were talking about the, all the things that have happened here in the world in the past couple of years, it's been such uh, a roller coaster for so many of us. I remember when Hurricane Katrina came through um, New Orleans and uh, through the South, and I had a lot of friends who were there in New Orleans. And I remember just sitting on the couch for two days straight, staring at the news and at the TV and got into such a funk and a depression over that and had to pull myself out of that because it, you know, I was doing nothing but staring at that television. And it, when you were talking about how we need to change our thoughts, and when we get into one of these situations, um, you know, as caregivers, it's easy for us to go down that rabbit hole of, of depression. When we find ourselves heading down that rabbit hole, how do we pull ourselves out of that funk? How do we 
mindfully change our thoughts. Yeah, and, and, and that's it. how we see things. I can tell you that, that when I'm looking at a, a river and evaluating it for, uh, for the appropriate, am I going to be able to get through this? Uh, is it got, are the rapids so, so intense that I might not survive going through them? I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to go uh, through that river. If, if there's more than a, a level three rapid, I'm, I'm probably probably not going to do that. And, and I think it's just that evaluating if I, it's, it's that experience when I recognize that I'm kind of cratering, I can do one of two things. I can say, hmm, I'm cratering right now. So I need to do that inventory. I need to look at where I'm expending my energy. I'm looking, I need to look about, uh, at, do I need to cut the news off right now for myself? Do I need to get out and do something good for myself? Do I need to pay attention? If I'm, if I'm uh, uh, going to a, a drink uh, two or three times and, and it's five o'clock somewhere, uh, might I be taking on uh, uh, depressants? Uh, alcohol is a CNS depressant, right? And if I'm already feeling good, some people say, I need a beer or I need, a, I need a drink, I need a margarita. Well, you know what, you're, what you're doing is you're treating your, your depressed mood with a depressant. Uh, we wanna do the opposite of that. We wanna get out and do something positive, that's that positive activities. We wanna reach out to those people who are there for us, right? And, and, and who take the time to recognize where we're maybe not treating ourselves as well as we treat other people and, and, and listen to them when they say, uh, Rob, go take care of yourself, buddy. Uh, get out of your role for 30 minutes a day can be enough. Take a walk around the, the neighborhood. We're going through uh, or going into a period of, of, of good, uh, of, of really good weather, especially in the mornings. Get out in the mornings. If you have 20 minutes, if you have 10 minutes, go walk around the block. If you have the ability to do that, do something different and it changes the way we, we think. And it, and, and it changes those emotions as we experience them. I, I, I promise you that works. That's great advice. Thank you so very much. We had a question about how do you resolve differences when you're the caregiver and you're caring for your spouse and you know what they need. And then you've got someone over here, whether it's a family member or it's a paid caregiver or someone on the other side where you've got differences of opinion going on and you've got your spouse and loved one caught in the middle who doesn't know which person to trust here because you've got all these different opinions happening. How do you make a resolution between those things? That's a great question. I suspect we all have been in those situations. I know it was with both of my parents at one time or another. I am going to almost always go with a trusted, and mark the word that I'm using, trusted caregiver, uh, a prescriber who I have, uh, who has good history with my loved one is going to always uh, provide for me information that is important and impactful for me. I also think about the quality of life for the person uh, for whom I'm caring. All of those things, you know, it's the standing uh, my, I can tell you that my brother and my sister uh, and I did not always see eye to eye at the end of my mom's life. Uh, and, and, and we consulted, we sat down and we talked and we agreed to disagree and we agreed to listen to one another without, without any kind of filters or anything like that so that we could see, I wanna look through somebody else's eyes. And then at the end of the day, looking through the lens of that person who's receiving the care, what would they want? That's why we do oftentimes those advanced directives. So at the end of the day, would my loved one want to be, uh, uh, have their life prolonged uh, artificially? I know Bridget and I both have uh, those advanced directives because neither of us want that. Uh, we don't want to, to be hooked. So there are all, all sorts of things that we, uh, that we can go to to inform those kinds of decisions. But at the end of the day, we communicate with one another respectfully. And when that respect is not forthcoming, we ask 
for it. We intentionally ask for it. Uh, there, there's no cookie cutter answer to that, but there is, I believe, in balancing my heart and my head. I take information in with my head and I balance it with my heart of, of what's the right thing to do. We are all, most of us are all well capable of, of operating at different levels and with lots of different uh, 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 input. And then ultimately, if we're the person who's been charged with care, we make that decision and we stick to it and we don't second guess ourselves. And you also mentioned, you know, Jeff is one of your great sounding boards. That's someone that you trust that you can talk to. Absolutely. And that also as caregivers, you know, we need to have our village around us as well of people that we can talk to, you know, the, our, uh, the doctor. Yeah. You know, and, if and we're dealing me, with a medical issue, you know, sure. let's talk to the doctor because there is a professional who is invested in our relationship with our loved one. So and, there's and someone let, that we can talk and, with. And let me say this, uh, I think Rob, it's, it's important. Uh, there is no perfect answer. There is no perfect answer. We're gonna always, I, I still think about the final days that my mom went through uh, when she was uh, comatose essentially and had no quality of life. Uh, my sister who's an ER doc, uh, was saying she's in pain. Well, I knew darn good and well she wasn't in pain, but they were they were essentially trying to ease her out, uh, and that was uncomfortable for me. Uh, and, and but in retrospect, uh, my sister was right, mm -hmm. and and I loved that about her because she held to her conviction as a care, you know as a, as a prescriber and caregiver. Those are all things that it, there's no perfect uh, situation, but we make those decisions as with as much information as we can possibly take in. We go to our faith uh, support and, and, and our prayer uh, and, and uh, those other people who we trust and love, uh, and we make that decision uh, together as much as is possible. And I think that is so important to, to say, I try to say that all the time when I'm speaking with the caregivers that, you know, we have to make decisions where we, don't look back, you know, two years later and go, oh, I wish I had, because we didn't have that information at the time when we we're making the decision. We make our best decision with the information we have, and that is the right decision at the time. Let's take this just one step a little bit further. When we were um, in the presentation, you were asking people, you know, what are your stressors? What are things that stress you? One of the responses was that they're, they're caregiving for their mother who has dementia, who is verbally abusive to them. And so when you have a stressing situation such as that, when you have an outside force that you can't change and it is causing your stress of your caregiving situation, how do you manage that stress when it's gonna come at you every day and you know it's coming at you every day, but it's something that you can't adjust? Yes, and, and, and that's where you uh, find your willingness, just like you would with news, negative news, uh, you, you have to uh, put yourself on a diet of that. Uh, what we know uh, as best we, we can understand Alzheimer's or those, uh, those end of life uh, uh, dementias and so forth, what we know uh, as best we're able to know it and, and I'm saying that intentionally, is that the, the, that individual does not realize what they're doing. Uh, they're operating on, on a level of cognition that is flawed, uh, that is, uh, that's produced for them a situation not unlike individuals who uh, have schizophrenia, who have uh, some level of delusion or, or uh, hallucinations, that sort of thing. It's a, it's a brain, it's a biophysiological function that's occurring. And their ability to see things and respond to things as you and I would, uh, where they say really hurtful and harmful things, uh, that's not really them. Uh, that's, that's almost like our brainstem. You know, people die uh, uh, 
from a from a brain standpoint long before their heart sometimes gives out right and that, that's that that's that brain stem activities uh, activity so some of that's driven uh, totally by things and that's how it's how we think about things which is um, is at a, as important as how we feel about them in those situations that's where it's okay to to think about them a little bit more than we feel about them and then not feel false guilt don't feel false guilt uh, false guilt is that guilt that uh, where we feel responsible and in point of fact, we are not. We, as you say, Rob, have no control over the, uh, the brain functioning of another human being. We can be kind to them as best they're willing to allow us to be kind. And when we hit that wall, uh, when we hit that wall, uh, that's that's where we uh, recognize that that we can do no more, and then we forgive ourselves in advance for uh, for kind of anesthetizing ourselves to that pain, uh, because it's not intended, and we have to we have to be very careful and mindful of of that, and and minim minimize our ability. We balance the time that we can spend with that individual with what we need to regenerate after having that experience. So that's just being, that's being aware of our, uh, of our dashboard and what we have to devote at any given time. Right, and that's where um, things like support groups are so important and helpful for caregivers. Um, organizations like Age of Central Texas, the Area Agency on Aging, AARP, all these other wonderful resources that are available to you as a caregiver to help you through those speed bumps in this journey. Because we all have the speed bumps. You know, no one went to school to be a caregiver and know everything that's going to be coming at you because there's always going to be the surprises. And it's just realizing that, okay, I can handle this. I'll figure, I will figure this out is what is so important. Um, in our last couple of minutes here, one thing that I was thinking about while you were talking, you were talking about how to address our issues to, you know, write them down. You know, here are, here are my things that I need to deal with. And then go through them like a checklist. So many times as caregivers, we get overwhelmed because we start thinking, okay, I've got to do this, not that, and this, and that. And then all, you know, before long, in a matter of just 30 seconds, we've overwhelmed ourselves because we have so much going in our world and I've got to go to work and I've got to take care of the kids and I've got my husband and, and you know, everything that is a part of our world in addition to being a caregiver for a loved one. And so writing those down is one great way of taking them from here and putting them somewhere to park them. When we did our very first Williamson County Caregiver Conference, we talked about many of these same things. And one thing that stuck with me so much was our, the presenter, his whole presentation was about you write everything down and then you go from one to two and then you go from two to three and then you go to three to four. You don't tackle them all at once. You take them one at a time. And I when you were talking know. about doing that, it brought back to me, you know, this is here eight years later, full circle. The same thing is so impactful and meaningful that as caregivers, we can't be expected to be everything for everyone. And we have to take care of ourselves first because the statistics show that caregivers who do not seek help in their caregiving role tend to pass away before the person they care for because of the stress and the physical decline that it causes on us. And when that happens, who's gonna be taking care of our loved one? And so we're not being selfish by practicing these mindful, important things. Amen. We're being better caregivers and giving better care by taking care of ourselves first. Yep, I couldn't have said it better myself. Lynn, I want to thank you so very much for spending the morning with us. I know that you have a very busy schedule. And Jeff Ripple, I want to thank you for being in the, in the background there assisting as well. And I want to thank you at home for joining us today. I know it, as caregivers, it's a lot to ask you to take an hour and a half out of your morning to learn something new and to open up yourself honestly to 
listen to what we need to do as caregivers to be better for ourselves and for our loved ones. So I certainly hope that you learned something new today that you can take with you this afternoon and help you in your journey. We will be back again tomorrow and on Thursday, same time, with more wonderful presentations for this eighth annual Williamson County Caregiver Conference to help you with your caregiving in this new normal. We hope that you have a wonderful day. Once again, Lynn, thank you so very much. Remember, we'll be sending you not only Lynn's PowerPoint, but also the materials that he spoke about. So watch for those to come in your email. And we hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Bless you all.